What's up, Clean Freaks? It's Hank Balch back in studio episode two with our rigid scope expert, Kurt Audet. Kurt, welcome back to the show today. Great to be back. Thanks, Hank. So anyone who missed episode one, that was a general kind of introduction to the scopes or uh, telescopes or endoscopes, whatever you want to call them in your own language or, you know, your own jargon out there. But we're talking about the same thing. It's how we're seen from outside of the human body, inside the human body, in all the technical aspect between uh, the eye and the patient. And there's a lot that's going on as we covered in episode one. So if anyone missed that, to go back right now or maybe after this episode and go check out episode one so you get caught up with us. But on today's episode, we're going to dive in uh, to the identification piece of this puzzle with Kurt. So obviously... IDing is important because it's going to tell us how to process the scope, and it's also going to tell us which scope belongs in which trays and go to which procedure. So this is really important. Where do we start? Yeah, and, you know, it's all about efficiency, right, Hank? So it's, it's interesting that you mentioned terminology, you know, telescopes, endoscopes. You know, how many times have we heard someone from somewhere come to us and say, hey, where's that bronchoscope? And you're like, is that the flexible, the rigid? So, you know, again, to your point, this, this session is geared towards the identification of a product, regardless of the manufacturer. There are some things that manufacturers do that are standardized and unique. And then there are others that's just used globally across the board. So I'm going to drop a visual up there. Um, so basically, when I say, you know, manufacturers across the industry have a standard, one of those standards is the eyepiece. So sure, we could take a Stuart, so we could take a Striker or an Olympus camera, and we could attach it to a telescope, and they could be used interchangeably. When we start to talk about multi-fluorescent technology, that's a little bit different. And, you know, we can talk about that in a later session as well. But when we talk about identifiers, there are some key identifiers that are used by different manufacturers. Um, and it's all about, to your point, hey, how do we high level disinfect this? How do we sterilize it? What are we reprocessing this, reprocessing? Or what are the clinical accessories are, that are required we can use with it? So, you know, this graphic here is just showing just a typical rigid endoscope that, you know, we can use different types of uh, light post connections, light cable connections, illumination bundle connections. Again, those universal terms that people use. Um, and then it's up to us to figure out as companies or OEMs, how can we provide education on which ones to use? So sometimes that's a model number nomenclature. Sometimes it's a color indicator. Um, you know, so this is just one manufacturer's color coding system to determine the angle of view of a scope. And, you know, for those of you who um, are not familiar with rigid endoscopes, rigid telescopes, um, they come in different shapes and sizes. So lengths, diameter, and angles of view, more importantly, it's about the space. So a traditional endoscope will look straight ahead. We have some that will work in the 30 degree spectrum. Um, when we look at this particular chart, we then have 45 and 70 and 90. Um, the color coding sequence here, this is not a universal standard. So different manufacturers, and this is important for you um, as you know, someone in the human medicine world to determine who your manufacturer is and what that standard is. Because you know, a green for a Smith & Nephew telescope might be something different for an Olympus telescope. So we don't want to assume that when you put it in that set, you know, and prep and pack that this is zero degree or this is a there or a 30. Um, you know, the other benefit to having color systems like this is that it's easy for the clinical staff in a darker room to be able to see a color indicator and not have to necessarily look at the angle that's, you know, placed on a scope. Uh, to determine that angle of view. So that can be difficult, especially if you're somebody like me who's getting up there in age and, you know, we don't always have our glasses or our contact lenses on, And uh, but right. it is what it is. But So a lot of manufacturers do things a couple different ways. Imagine you're colorblind and you can't see these colors. So with some manufacturers, they actually use the model number to indicate some different things. So with this particular manufacturer, the prefix, indicates the specialty. Uh, with this particular uh, vendor, they also use the suffix. So in this case, the A would indicate 
that it's a zero degree telescope looking straight ahead. Um, and they may indicate the color band ring with the color green. And then, you know, you can kind of see the matrix we have here. Depending on the model of the scope, um, there are some unique identifiers with some manufacturers. So imagine this model number appears and we have an A, but now we have a letter W in the middle between the A and the B. That indicates something unique about the telescope. So in this example, it's a wide, it's a wide angle telescope, just a wider field of view. Or maybe um, we're doing something with the light post where we're offsetting it, you know, in sinus procedures when we just want the light cable out of the way. So it's not in the patient's field of view or it's not in the clinician's field of view. So those are just some of the different um, things that manufacturers use to identify different telescopes. Model number is a good indicator. Always, we're always using the same visuals, you know, angle of view with a numerical value on it. Um, but in general, it's it's I won't say it's standardized, but there are some standardized processes that vendors use. If a user's um, trying to find this information, right? So let's say maybe they have one manufacturer, like one primary manufacturer for their scopes, or maybe they have multiple manufacturers, but they're like, hey, I want to know what these colors mean, and I want to know if there's a model breakdown. It's a really helpful visual right here, but I'm thinking, who has access to this? Where did you get it from? So where do they go to get this kind of information? Yeah, great question. So a lot of times you'll find it in the instructions for use or the IFUs. If you don't find it there, then I'm reaching out to my account executive, my service person, um, whoever your contact point person is for that particular company. So with the company I you know reside with, we have various different ways that that can happen and support you. Um, but there are definitely, let's call them cheat sheets that are out there. But you and I both know that, you know, those cheat sheets have to be a controlled document. And if we're providing something that is not controlled, it's an off-label communication. So we obviously want to make sure that any documentation that's provided is also captured as a control document or within the instructions for use. Great question, Hank. Uh yeah, that's great. I mean, this kind of decoding is always a lot of fun. And any of this information you can get out there, you know, the hands of the frontline clinicians, especially in SPD, to help to identify the specifics around these scopes, even like that specialty piece. I'm not sure that I ever knew that a product prefix could be used in that capacity. I probably should have known, but now I know, you know, nine years or <laughs> guess maybe 14 years too late, Peter Kerr, but, <laughs> but thanks. Yeah, it's like cracking a code. It's, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> All right. So, you know, that's going to do it for episode two here, but we're going to get Kurt back in studio to start talking about the optics piece of this puzzle. And I say start talking about it, but I guess we've already been talking about it ever since episode one. We're going to dive into it in this episode three coming up. So if you're not already subscribed to our channels to catch this series, make sure and do so right now. Click the like and subscribe. And if you're not connected with Kurt yet through LinkedIn or if you haven't reached out through email, just say hi. Say, hey, Kurt, I've been watching your series. It's been a lot of fun. And build that connection just in case you ever have some of these random kind of questions that we just talked about today. That's why he's here. He wants to be a resource for you. So everyone um, tuning in, we want to thank you as we do each and every week here at Beyond Clean and remind you, like we always do, to keep fighting dirty.